species last week. So now we're back to herbaceous species and we're going to tackle a group that, you know, traditionally I think most people would say are pretty difficult and at least one level they are. Carex are pretty easy to, as Lance said, to identify to genus most of the time. But then, you know, the species, what species is it? Well, I'm going to help you tonight, again, I think get to a level where you could pretty well comfortably identify we're going to look at 24 species, but you know, at least 20 of those species are pretty easy to identify just by sight. Uh, you know, again, there's a lot of variation in the sedges, so there are some that have some very unique characteristics. But then, of course, there's always a lot of similarity. The challenging thing with sedges is there's always at least one or two species that probably look like the one that you're looking at. So. That's what's uh, usually the challenge is to separate out those similar species. And we'll take a look at some of those in the, in the table I put together. So um, yeah, the genus Carex, it's, it is one of the largest genera in the vascular plants. There's roughly 2000 species in the genus worldwide. And North America, last count has about 480. Uh, in, in North America. We have about one fourth of those in Iowa. So about 120 different species of Carex in Iowa. So by far, at least in Iowa, it is the, the genus that has the most species. The term or the word Carex, the name Carex comes from Latin, which means uh, something to cut, something that's able to cut. And I guess it's probably in reference to the sometimes sharp edges or margins on leaves and certainly sometimes the sharp edges on the stems if the stem is tri triangular. There's uh, you know, a lot of importance in sedges and that's one reason you should, you know, I guess want to be able to deal with them a little bit better rather than just Carex spa. Uh, ecologically speaking, uh, they obviously have a lot of importance in terms of forage production and primary productivity. They're, they're graminoids or grass-like. So again, they produce a fair amount of graminoid or grass-like vegetative structure, which can provide cover, of course, for, for small mammals and birds. Uh, another thing that maybe you don't think of, and, and I think this is certainly true and especially important in, in forests and woodlands is the uh, potential for fine fuel. Being a graminoid again, like other grasses, they produce fine fuels, which help to carry fires. They do have, uh, fruits, of course, we'll talk about their fruits. They have fruits that contain seeds. And of course, those seeds are uh, something that could be sought after by seed predators, the number of, of small birds and small mammals. Like grasses, I think we can think about them as being very, very important in terms of their root structure and growth below ground and the, the amount of soil building and soil binding that those root systems are going to do. We could also talk about, I think, um, especially because of their vegetative capabilities and to some extent their competitiveness, uh, they can be very competitive against invasive species. In terms of uh, insects, of course, well, of course, they're not producing any nectar. So uh, nectar eating insects are not going to find much use for them. But there's um, a vast number of insects, of course, that will utilize their leaves as forage, uh, grasshoppers, of course, uh, larval of bill bugs and leaf miners. Aphids will, of course, suck um, phloem, uh, suck some of the sap from the phloem tissue. There's a number of um, butterflies. They, their larvae utilize uh, wetland sedges as, as a food source. So again, there's a, there's a long list of, of importance here. So let's take a look at what we need to know to get to the point where you can be more comfortable with sedges. So this uh, shows again, of course, here in the Cyper ACE, and there's a list of characteristics here that, that can pertain to this family, which of course includes other species besides the sedges. So the triangular stems, you know, is not always the case with sedges, but many of them do. They may also have more gradually rounded corners and not be quite as, as sharply three-sided. Three of course, they're going to have these, those entire linear parallel vein leaves. They have the sheath, which is a modified petiole 
uh, the sheath that wraps around the stem, of course, like, like other grasses do. Unlike grasses though, sedges are, are, are exclusively um, closed sheath. So the sheaths are always closed. Most grasses are open. Um, most sedges are, are closed, which means of course that the sheath is just completely fused into a solid um, circular tubular piece of tissue that surrounds the stem from the node where the leaf starts up the stem to the top of the sheath right here, where then there's a blade, of course, that um, is attached. There's usually a weakly developed ligule. Um, that's right here. So they're much more weakly developed than in the grasses, but they're certainly there. They usually are seen as uh, having much of the ligule is sort of uh, fused to the base of the leaf and just the margins of the ligule are kind of free here like we can see. What we're going to pay attention to with the ligules and sedges is whether the ligule is longer. So from about right, this is the base of the ligule right here. So is the length of it going from here up to here, is that greater than or less than the, the width going across? This one's about the same. Uh, I skipped over three rank. That's what this diagram is showing there. Uh, they're not always strongly three rank, but again, if they do have a pretty well developed triangular stem, then most likely if you were to look down onto the plant from the top, uh, you would see sort of again, three ranks of leaves. The flowers are mostly bisexual. This is again in the Cyperaceae. In the in Carex, as we're gonna see in just a little bit, they are always unisexual. But again, this is, this is looking at characteristics in the family first. Flowers are always reduced, um, meaning of course that they're very small. The perianth, which is a term referring to the, the sepals and the petals, it's either modified or, or completely gone. Uh, usually in most of the Cyperaceae, it is, it is still present as some kind of modification, bristles or something like that. We talk about scales a lot in the Cyperaceae and the sedges, and these scales are essentially floral bracts. So this little bract right here, uh, which sits at the base of this flower here, uh, another term for that is simply scale. And that's again, a term that is most often used in this fam family. The flowers uh, are in spikelets, the primary inflorescence, again, at the family level, Cyperaceae. This is a typical um, Cyperaceae inflorescence with each of these scales here sitting at the base of and subtending and kind of surrounding a small floret. And again, so what's happening is it's the same thing you see here. Each of these circles is a flower. Each of these uh, little curved structures right here is, is a bract or a scale and a spike just means that the flowers are attached by their base. There isn't any flower stalk present. Again, no nectar. There is pollen, of course, a lot of pollen for wind pollination. And so some insects or some bees that utilize pollen might, might make use of that. The fruit is an akene, which means that it's a dry fruit, again, meaning that the pericarp is real thin. That's the fruit wall. The, which comes from the wall of the ovary. Uh, real thin, doesn't have any flesh you know, associated with it. It surrounds the seed. The seed inside is just, there's just one. So in the keen is a single seeded uh, dry and indehiscent fruit. Indehiscent meaning that it's not gonna split open on its own. The fruit wall, the pericarp has to degrade or uh, become softer somehow. Uh, break down a little bit, uh, might go through a digestive system for that to happen. It might just do be uh, more of a physical thing from, from weathering. Um, eventually that has to happen for the seed to be able to grow. But yeah, then in Carex, um, so now we're looking at char characteristics that are you know, exclusively for, for Carex. Uh, again, stems usually are trigonous, but not always, it can be rounded. This uh, stem right here in tubuloides, you know, doesn't look real triangular at all. A uh, little bit more of a round shape to it. 
Leaves are always usually at the base. There's always some basal leaves, always for the most part. The ligule, again, here we can see the ligule really nicely right here on this bent back leaf here, the blades bent back and there's the ligule again. Again, as I said, the base of it or much of it's fused to the leaf blade and just the margins of it are kind of free there. And again, as I said, this is one thing that separates Carex from most of the other Cyperaceae and that's that the flowers are unisexual. That means again, that there's flowers that are only female. Those are pistillate flowers. And there's fl other flowers that are only male. Those are staminate flowers. The flowers again, always occur in these um, spikelets, as, as we said in Cyperaceae, they occur in these spikelets. But in Carex, what happens is these, the female flowers, you know, the female spikelets, those female spikelets are reduced to just a single floret, one floret. And so really what happens there is that we, when we see a, the female part of a, of a sedge, it looks like it might be, a, you might call it a spikelet because you see all of those, those flowers. But since each of those flowers is actually a one flowered spikelet, then what we're seeing there is the secondary inflorescence, the inflorescence in which the primary inflorescences, these one flowered spikelets, how they are arranged. So they are arranged in spikes. So that is why we always call those spikes and we don't call them spikelets. The pistillate flowers are subtended by two bracts and that comes as a result of the reduction of those, those uh, spikelets to just one flower. The outer one is this scale, it's called a pistillate scale. And so that pistillate scale is always present and it sits, uh, sort of sits right below and subtends the inner scale or inner bract, the perigenium. So the perigenium, in this little diagram here, again, this, this pink is the pistillate scale. The perigenium is this red. But this is, this is a line drawing, of course, and so it's like a cross section in, in a sense. The perigenium is actually an, an enclosed sac. It's a small enclosed sac that surrounds the pistillate flower. So inside here is the pistillate flower, which consists of an ovary and, of course, a style. And then two or three style branches that come up through the beak of the perigenium and out an orifice at the top. So this red here again, this is the body of the perigenium down in here. This is the beak of the perigenium right through here and there may or may not be teeth at the top of the perigenium. Again, there is no perianth present in the carex. Again, that's something that's somewhat different from other Cyperaceae. So that's a nice diagram that shows what ha was happening with the pistillate uh, plants. Here's an actual picture of um, the perigenium and the pistillate scales. So here's a perigenium. Here is a scale uh, for this perigenium right here. This one's opened up so we can see the, you know, they're describing this now as an akene. So the ovary has already matured into the fruit, which is the uh, uh, akene. Here's one that's uh, you know, not been tampered with here. So there's the pistillate scale. There's a perigenium. And all of these, again, each one of these perigenia and its, its subtending pistillate scale, again, represents a one flowered spikelet that are all arranged in a usually somewhat very dense spike. And that's why we call these spikes. The male flower is a little bit different. Uh, they're not arranged the same way. The male flowers are just very, very reduced. They simply have a, uh, a scale, a staminate scale, uh, and then the flower. <laughs> and the flower is just composed of uh, usually three stamens. That's it. Uh, it's, it's, there's not much there. But again, uh, the sexes are in separate flowers. They can be mixed together in the same spike, but they are in separate flowers. 
So we're going to uh, talk about some characteristics that we're going to use to form just some real basic groups in order to tackle these 24 um, fairly common and somewhat easy to identify characters. And so just real quickly, I'm going to take a look at some of these characteristics. These are really easy things to see. These are, these are things you look forward again to sort of separate the characters into uh, one of, of, of several possible groups. And the first thing that's it's always used is simply just the number of those carpels that are in the ovary. Consequently, also the number of style branches or stigmas. Again, as I said back here, there can be two or three. And these also correspond to the shape of the perigenia. So if you have a species that has two style branches, because it's again has two carpels um, in the uh, compound pistil, uh, we call that bifid. Those perigenia are going to be basically flat. Um, they can have a little bit of a rounded shape on one of the two sides. They, they could be biconvex, which would be um, sort of rounded on both sides, slightly convex on both sides, or plano convex, flat on one side, convex on the other side, um, but basically lens shaped. Or if they have three, style branches and tree stigmas, then they're going to be roughly three-sided or roughly um, not, com not maybe completely round, at least though they give the impression of being round. Um, in some cases they are pretty much round. Uh, other cases they're, they're sort of uh, bluntly three-sided. The corners are kind of rounded off. I'll show you some pictures again in, in a little bit later. So here's a couple examples of, of either of those, Tribuloides and um, Carex polita. Here we can see three style branches in the circle right here. And these again look more roundish, more three-dimensional, these perigenia, uh, than these over here. These have a, a, you know, much more of a flat look to them. Although of course that's kind of hard to see in a two-dimensional picture. The other, next thing is really easy, just whether or not that perigenia surface is, is glabrous, as you can see here on the left with atheroides and ebernia, or if it's hairy, if, it's, if it has some pubescence. So this, this might require hand lens, uh, you know, take a good look at those perigenia. But again, this is going to be a real easy characteristic to see. Number three, this is a little more complicated, but this is an important one. We need to, again, uh, ascertain what the sexuality of the spikes is. And so again, remember that the uh, flowers are unisexual, the sexes are in separate flowers. But as I said, they, they can be either completely on separate spikes, which would be unisexual spikes like we see right here. And these is, this is really easy to see that these spikes right here are pistillate because they're just packed full of perigenia. And this spike up here, very slender, you can't see much there, but if you look real close, we'd see a bunch of scales, uh, empty scales now probably because the stamens that were there and were exerted and releasing pollen much earlier uh, are completely gone now. All you see is just a whole bunch of, of empty scales. So this is unisex, unisexual. Over here, the spikes are bisexual. So in each one of these spikes here, these spikes are a little bit harder sometimes to, to see and separate, but here's a spike right here. And then here's a spike right here. What we see here in this case is the staminate flowers, the male flowers are out towards the, uh, up the top of that spike. And the female flowers or the perigenia are at the bottom part of that spike. So again, it could be either of those two possibilities, um, male at the top, female at the bottom or vice versa. Uh, the important, important point here again is that the spikes are bisexual. Both types of flowers are in the same spike. Now you have a species like the VCI, and this is one of our, our easy to identify common uh, species that characteristically always has the terminal spike like this. So it has a bisexual spike out here as a terminal spike, the top one. And it usually has the females at the top and the males at the bottom. We can see these are male flowers here because again, all they are, are just empty scales. And then the other spikes, the lateral spikes, the lower spikes are, are unisexual and fe female. 
So you might have a situation where you have both of them present. What we're gonna use in this uh, sort of breakdown of, of you know, forming these basic groups is look at the sexualized spikes. You know, again, generally that's important here, but with respect to the groups that we're gonna be forming, more specifically, we wanna look at that terminal spike and see what the situation is with it. So again, this would be the one we'd be looking at. We'd say this one is bi bisexual. This one's a terminal one over here, it's unisexual. And this one is a terminal one over here and it's bisexual. Okay, then we're gonna look at those perigenia again. You see the perigenia are very, very important. Uh, you need to have perigenia if you're going to, um, in most cases, you know, do anything with, with a, a sedge. So whether or not the perigenia uh, have teeth at the tip of the beak. Now, in some cases, they don't even have a beak. So Carex stricta doesn't really even have a beak at all. And so it doesn't have a beak, it doesn't have any teeth. Uh, this one has a very distinct beak right through here. This portion would be the beak. Now it's always gonna be a little bit tricky to, you know, if you have to measure the beak or measure the body, and the tricky part is always just trying to say, well, where does the body, where is the top of the body and where is the bottom of the beak? Uh, there isn't a real hard and fast way. Sometimes in, um, it, you have to read the, the information in maybe a key that you might be using and see how the, the author of the keys has uh, decided to treat that characteristic. In some cases, they've considered the, the beak to start at the top of the akeen uh, inside the perigenia. Other times they you know, consider, well, where there's sort of this inflection point right here where it narrows down quickly. So the top of the, the body is about right here. And from about here on up then is, is beak. This one clearly has very obvious teeth, very long and, and robust teeth. This one has a short beak right in through here and still has a couple of teeth there. Those certainly qualify as teeth, just not quite as, as long. So looking at the, looking at the perigenia, uh, most of them will have a beak uh, of, of some kind, a few don't, but then uh, deciding whether there's teeth or not. Okay, now coming back to those spikes again, we're going to um, have another important character here, which is just looking at the gender of the flowers at the, in the top position uh, on the terminal spike. This is another characteristic that's also used to describe bisexual spikes. Since we know bisexual spikes by definition have both sexes, then again, it's important to, again, in this situation here, for example, when you have bisexual spikes, characterize the spike as either being androgynous, meaning there's male flowers at the top, or gynecandrous, meaning that there's female flowers at the top. So again, these two are going to be the situation when the spike is bisexual. Again, it's just, this can be a somewhat difficult because you're looking at the characters when, uh, when the perigenia are formed, usually you have to have perigenia forming. That usually means that the stamina flowers have already done their job. Pollen has been dispersed and they're falling apart and the stamens are gone. So this one, there's a few um, filaments still kind of hanging on there in these few scales. And that's what gives us the clue that th this is where the staminate flowers, uh, well, they still are there. Um, or in this case, we see empty scales down and through here, scales that don't have anything else associated with them. There's no perigenia associated with these scales like there are up here. These scales up here have perigenia associated with them. These scales down here don't. So this tells you again that these, these empty scales are where the staminate flowers were. Then of course, if it's, if it's a unisexual uh, terminal spikelet, then it's, it's most of the time, it's always going to be male. I won't ever say 100% because it always seems like there's an exception, but uh, certainly almost all the time, if there's a, well, it's either gonna be male or it will be a bisexual one. 
Then we're gonna look at perigenial width. That's a real simple thing. You know, you can kind of get an eye for this, but quite often you may have to, of course, collect perigenia and take them uh, back and look at them closer and, and actually put a, um, a ruler on them or a caliper. So these two here, um, the, the, the amount of you know, width that we're looking for here is two millimeters. And so whether they're less than two millimeters, like we see here, we can see the scale down here. By the way, most of these photographs, again, I listed the photographs, the sources of the photographs on the front slide there, but almost all of these photographs that are really good and show these perigenia uh, in this form here come from the Minnesota site. The Minnesota website is, is excellent when it comes to uh, showing the details of sedges. So either they're less than two millimeters or they're more than two millimeters. And the last one, there are seven of these characteristics, is whether or not the, the uh, inflorescence, the secondary inflorescence, um, which would really be, uh, well, the secondary inflorescences are the spikes, whether the, these spikes, uh, as you see here in this sort of cartoon diagram, whether they are just simply all attached to the main axis of the plant like this, meaning that there, there's no branching in the, uh, inflorescence structure here. This would be the tertiary inflorescence, this one right here. So this is a tertiary. These spikes are secondary. And of course, each of the perigenia is the pri pri primary. But the point here again is whether or not there's any branching, whether, whether the, the uh, tertiary inflorescences have any branching. And it's particularly going to be at the base, like you see right here, where there's actually a branch right here that has has uh, spikes attached to it. That's what we're seeing over here in Carex diandra. These, these down through here are branches with multiple spikes attached to these branches. Whereas this species right here, of course, these are just all just, this is an individual spike. There's a spike there, a spike there. These are, these look just like this. All right, that takes us through the seven characteristics um, let's, um, let's take a look at the 24 species that we're going to take a look at here. So I'm going to jump out of this like I've done before and pull up the uh, handout that I gave you because this has the table in it, the reference table. We can go through these first ones quickly here. We'll come back to those slides. I'm going to get to the table. So the table again is going to provide you with uh, 24, I would say relatively common species. These 24 species again are, are, can be pretty easy to recognize. Now there's gonna be some that are difficult, but there's at least, I would say at least half of them could be recognized almost just like that uh, because they're so distinctive. So again, uh, if you haven't been to one of these workshops before, this is a table I've been doing for all of them uh, for whatever, um, you know, the focus is whatever genus we're looking at. In this case, of course, I'm just giving you 24 common species, not, not all 120, um, can't do that. But again, it shows um, some information. The first column here is the uh, taxonomy according to flora of North America, which is been done or has been done and is out there. So we know what flora of North America is using uh, for their scientific names. The nomenclature in Iowa and Rosa, of course, which is the checklist of Iowa plants that you might be using to, to identify plants in Iowa, common name, and then some of the similar species. Uh, I skipped over this part. So this is the status. Uh, special concern is uh, the listing for Carex aggregata, which of course means it's, a, uh, it's one of the three levels of imperiled uh, species. It turns out that um, Carex aggregata is really not special concern at all. It got uh, put into that category many, many years ago when there weren't very many vouchers of it in the herbaria and it, was, it, it appeared to be pretty uncommon. But the problem of course was that there were lots of misidentifications and people just weren't collecting it. Uh, it's a really common species uh, actually, as you can see in the distribution map here. Its coefficient is actually has went down because of that from five to two. So again, this is the coefficient of conservatism, which is just the number from one to ten that describes how um, how much affinity, higher coefficient, higher affinity 
the species has for undist undisturbed, pristine natural areas. You might even go so much to say as you know, they, they, how much they require and, and need that type of environment. This, uh, these Iowa distribution maps here are based upon Norris and Zeiger's work. So Bill Norris and Scott Zeiger have been working on Carex for, uh, well, they're pretty much done with it now, but they worked on Carex for probably 10 years almost looked at um, 10,000 vouchers or something like that, um, 10 to 12,000 vouchers. So that's what this information comes from. Uh, they're uh, looking at those vouchers, annotating them, getting the correct names on them, and then seeing where they were. You're gonna see most of these are, are statewide. And then of course, this is the map then by Bonap, which shows you what the uh, distribution is at the level of the whole country. And the coding here means uh, green means uh, forest, generally a forest species, yellow means uh, grassland species, and blue would mean more of a wetland species. Habitat descriptions come in here from a variety of sources. So here's the list. Um, there's four, uh, four species on each page here. Not too much to say about most of these. Again, we're gonna look at all of these in the, um, in the PowerPoint. I just wanted to quick touch on, again, this table. Um, if there's anything here to mention. Again, um, one of the nice things, of course, with the Bonap map here is you can, you can get to see kind of what the species is doing outside of Iowa. Uh, and if there's no shading on it, that means that it's pretty variable in its habitat, like conjuncta is here. Conjuncta you can find, on, you can find in floodplain forests, you can find actually in, in alluvial soils, more open wet metal types of environments. I've seen them out on, on uh, prairie-like environments at least. So um, not clear, you know, whether to call that a prairie species, a grassland species, or a forest species. All right, if you have any questions that pop up here. So, oh, here's one. So Carex frankii, uh, <clears throat> this is the one species that I wasn't sure whether to include or not. I, I had, I came up with 23 real common species, you know, uh, pretty pretty quickly. And I was trying to pick, well, what should I use for the 24 species? And um, I decided to go with Frankii because despite this uh, indication here that it's not statewide, it, it may not be statewide, but I'm certainly seeing it uh, a lot more than what would be represented here. Here, uh, I think it's uh, overlooked species and you do see it in fairly uh, low conservative type, types of environments, um, somewhat, somewhat kind of dis disturbed places. So I decided to put it in. It's also a little bit different from other sedges. It's a really distinctive sedge, so that's another reason I put it in. But I could have probably used uh, Carex stricta here, uh, tussock sedge, or probably Carex musicoria, the midland sedge. Those are two other species that are pretty common. But I went with Frankie eye. All right. Um, so we'll be taking a look at these again, so these, the similar species again, so when you when you think you have this figured out and you think it's Carex hedinii, these are the species that you'd need to kind of, you know, maybe check or take a look at. Uh, and you'd have to use a key or some, or some type of book or something to help you do that because, um, it, well, in some cases, these similar species are included in these 24, uh, but um, most of the time they're not going to be. So for example, um, I didn't include Carex stricta, for example, in, the, in, the, in these 24 species. All right, so that is a quick look at this table, which I hope is helpful. It takes quite a while to put this together. And then here's some references, and here's the grouping that we're going to look at, uh, how to split these Carex out into basic groups. And I, I put it here on the handout so you'd have it there. We're gonna go through this on the PowerPoint in just a little bit, it'll be coming up next. So I'll, I won't go through it here, I'll go through it on the PowerPoint. And again, if you haven't been here before, I, I keep building on this plant glossary, plant terminology, um, added a few more terms here that relate to sedges. Uh, for example, perigenia is in here, or perigenium now is in here. And a few other things like bract, um, spikelet. All right, so that's what that is. All right, I'll go to the PowerPoint.
Okay, so now again, we're going to use these three factors, the number of styles or stigmas, and again, that relates to the shape of the perigenia, the sexuality of the spikes, and the gender of the florets at the top of the terminal spike, male or fe female. Use those three characteristics to form um, eight basic groups. And this is just to remind you again what this, this all important uh, first characteristic here, the number of styles or stigmas. There's 11 species that have two, therefore they have um, biconvex or planal convex types of long sections through their perigenia. It looked like this. There's 13 of the 24 are trigonous or more or less spherical. So they can have sort of a sharply triangular shape or a little bit more of a rounded triangular shape because these corners get rounded off. And then what we're gonna do is again use the, the other two characteristics, the sexuality and the gender to form four groups then within the groups, the 11 species that have two styles or two stigmas. You'd have two that are again, could be bisexual and then male or female or unisexual and male and female. Same thing over here. Um, these all have three. But again, you could have bisexual and then male or female and unisexual male or female. So those form the basic eight groups. And if you look at this first group, two bisexual and male, this group right here, then we're going to have to use the branching of the inflorescence as a way to separate them into these two groups, because all six of these are in this group. So how to separate them into a smaller group that you can deal with is the whether the inflorescence is branched or not. And we can see here again that, and this is gonna happen, uh, sometimes there are species because they have individual variation within the species, within the, well, within, the within the species, individuals vary. Uh, you could have a situation where, you know, you could be looking at a individual of C. gravida and you could see it being branched, or you could like have an individual of C. gravida and it'd be unbranched. So this falls out in both places. The two bisexual female produces these six. And here we're gonna use the width of the perigenia to further separate them into two smaller groups. Then the last two groups in this, in with, with two styles or two stigmas, there's uh, two unisexual male. There's just one species that fits in there, Hadinii, that's easy. And there are no unisexual uh, and with female flowers in the uh, top position there. Again, that just does not, does not happen for the most part. Okay, so let's take a look at, at these. I'm gonna go through these uh, fairly quickly. Most of these just have great pictures. There really isn't any key here to speak. You, you get them into these groups and then you're just gonna look at, at pictures here and, and see some of these characteristics that are useful. Uh, here we're gonna compare uh, conjuncta um, here with Volpanoidea. And conjuncta is a pretty distinctive in its strongly three wing stems. Can't see that very well here, but those stems really have three very, very uh, uh, strongly winged or triangular, you might say. They're, they're, they're triangular, but they're even so much strongly triangular that the corners actually form little wings. The stem is fairly soft and, and compressible. Uh, the lower part of the uh, she's the ventral side. This is called the ventral side of the she's has all this cross wrinkling on it, or it's called rugose. Uh, cross wrinkling is, is um, useful. And the um, perigenia, here's the perigenia. Here's, so in these pictures, we'll see perigenia. We'll see the pistillate scales and we'll see an akeem. This is all laid out really nice again uh, in photos from the Minnesota site. Usually the tertiary inflorescence here, these, um, these branches here, for example, there's a lot of space between them. So the, the, um, per, the uh, inflorescence is not real crowded. So that's, those are all useful. Here's a picture of the ligule. Sometimes the ligule is useful, sometimes not. 
Well, here's again a species that is going to be in the same group and, and might look a little bit like it. It has branched inflorescences as well. Uh, brown fox sedge, Opanoidea. Uh, you know, it's it's somewhat, somewhat distinctive again because of the the branched inflorescences down here. This the uh, keys all use a characteristic that the um, flowering stems, the combs that have the inflorescences on them, tend to be uh, shorter than the leaves. In other words, the, the, the leaves equal or far exceed the height of the inflorescent stems, the stems that have the flowers on them. That's usually pretty good. It helps to separate it from its most similar species, Carexonectins. However, um, late in the growing season, much later in the growing season, that doesn't work so well because later in the growing season, the flowering combs of uh, Vopinodia can continue to elongate somewhat and therefore get taller. And you know that characteristic won't work as well. Then what you have to use to separate it from the nectins is usually the um, perigenia here and the, and the beak. In Vopinodia here, the uh, beak is typically at least one half and this is where it gets difficult deciding where the beak starts, but the beak, this portion right through here, is a, a, about one half the length of the entire per, perigenia, which is um, more than in anectins. All right, we gotta keep moving and get through all 24 species. Here's uh, another two species that are very common, and with some practice, you can learn to identify these. Uh, Gravida, heavy sedge, grows in grasslands. Um, and I'll just pull the other one up, uh, Carex aggregata, uh, clustered sedge, which can be in grasslands. I see it uh, I see it occasionally in grasslands, so it gets more confusing there. It's probably much more often, and if you look at the table, uh, it's mainly going to be in, in forests, shaded environments. But here's some things to help separate these two because, um, you know, their general look, Here's the top of the flowering inflorescence here in Gravida. Here it is on Aggregata, look pretty similar. And these, these perigenia look pretty much the same as well. What the books say and keys say is to look at the she's, you look at vegetative characteristics. And these two figures or pictures here, again, try to show this. And I see that it works fairly well, but I'm gonna give you another characteristic too. Um, this is the one that you'll see in FNA and some of the keys. If you look at the lower she's or any of the she's, probably the lower ones at least, uh, you'll see that the top of the sheath right through here at the top of the sheath, this is fairly thin. In fact, it's so thin that it easily tears. Whereas on aggregata at the top of the sheath, this is, a, you can see in this one, it's, it's thicker. It's the thicker um, tissue there. And it's got a little bit of a cartilaginous look to it, which means that it's just tougher. And therefore these aren't as likely to tear. So that, you know, that's supposed to be one of the classic ways to separate these two species. Although you do need to have good she's to do that. Lately, I've been seeing a different characteristic that I use and it shows up here. You look at the, at the uh, other side of the sheath. This is the ventral side, this is the dorsal side you see these green and white striations, green and white lines. The green lines are the veins, the white is the area between the veins. And we're seeing that here. In aggregata, those are more broken up. The white areas are more broken up into sort of disconnected white lines and therefore it's more, has more of a spotted look to it. Whereas in gravita, again, these white lines are pretty continuous. That I think actually works a little bit better than the uh, sheath characteristic. Now, Rosia, uh, again, what we're looking at here are two uh, bisexual male. So we've gone, still looking at two, of course, bisexual male, unbranched inflorescences now. So we got, we're gonna have two species or just one species here, I guess, so Carex Rosia. This one is gonna be, um, difficult to separate from Carex radiata, which is its similar species. But Rosie is a lot more common, so I didn't put radiata in here. 
Rosia is sometimes called the curly style sedge because the styles um, at, the, at the right time, as shown up here in this uh, top picture here of the perigenia, are kind of curled, somewhat like a ram's horn. You, you get to uh, Rosia, of course, because the whole gestalt of this plant uh, shown here is that it's a fairly tufted or cespitose clumped sedge uh, with these um, very sparse sort of you know, spikes here, a few perigenia, the perigenia spreading in all directions and quite a bit of space between them. So rosy and radiata both kind of look like this. Uh, radiata would, would have the uh, style branches uh, more or less straight, whereas rosia has them somewhat curved. There's some other characteristics that can be used to separate uh, those two. Again, um, the leaves actually work pretty well. The leaves on rosia here are wider than the leaves on radiata. The widest leaves on rosia are generally at least two millimeters, up to two and a half millimeters wide, and the leaves on radiata are less than two. You can also use the amount of sponginess in the base of the perigenia as another characteristic. We'll go on to uh, Hedinii next here. <clears throat> so Hedinii would be uh, paired up with Carextricta as its look alike or similar species. And here uh, again, both of them are pretty common. I guess I, I probably think Hedinii is a little more common because it's um, It'll grow in sedge meadows as well as uh, wet prairies. Both of them, <clears throat> excuse me, both of them have ligules that look like this. Have ligules that are fairly tall, taller than they are wide. They can't use that. The way um, they're usually separated is on the, well, a couple of different things. On the um, she's, they both tend to have the what's called ladder fribulose sheaths. What we see here, the sheaths are breaking down, the tissues in the sheaths are breaking down and the veins stay intact, stay behind, stay present. And that creates sort of this ladder fiber-like structure. That's much more developed, much more well-developed in stricta than it is in Hedinii. But Hedinii will have a little bit of that. Probably what is more often used is the scales, the scales, the pistillate scales, as you can see here on Hedinii, exceed uh, by quite a bit the perigenia. In stricta, uh, they don't exceed the perigenia. They're more about even with the per perigenia. Now, these things can vary, of course. So uh, sometimes you have to use a you know, couple of characteristics. You can also use the shape of the perigenia somewhat. In Hedinii, the perigenia are more uh, obovate. They tend to be a little bit wider towards the top of the perigenia than at the base. Again, um, can be difficult to separate it from stricta. Christotella is a pretty common, and this is a pretty easy one. It's going to be paired up with uh, tribuloides here. <clears throat> they both are, are they key out and come out together at the same place pretty much. They both have um, perigenia here in which the wings, which you can see some wings at the top of the perigenia right in through here, narrow wing here, a little bit wider wing right in here. Those wings um, disappear or become non-existent when you get down to the base. So that, that's one characteristic that separates these two species from other, other similar looking species in the O, o Valleys. Uh, then to separate these two from each other, uh, Christotella here has uh, spikes that are much more spherical or globose. We can also see vegetatively here, Christotella has these little winged ribs that come down from the base of the uh, blade. This is the blade of the leaf up here. This is the top of the sheath, of course, right here. Um, so on either side here, there's little wing tissues, a little, little wing that projects from the, from the base of the blade, uh, goes down the stem of uh, ways. Don't see that on tribuloides. Tribuloides uh, has perigenia 
and um, well, the perigenia are a little bit more slender and narrow, but there's the spikes are more ellipsoid or more ovoid shaped, not as spherical as uh, these globose ones over here. Also, the perigenia on Christotella, they tend to st stick straight out. The perigenia are more spreading. And even the tips of the perigenia sometimes are recurved, or curving downwards. So the more globose perigenia sticking straight out, sticking straight out, more spreading, somewhat recurved versus perigenia, uh, excuse me, spikes over here that are more uh, ovoid, egg shaped, and perigenia that are ascending. These perigenia point upwards. Pycnidae uh, is a prairie species uh, compared with Molesta and Breviar. These two are real common. Uh, Pycnidae is a little higher conservative. These are in the old valleys. So again, they're in this group that's kind of difficult. Uh, all of the old valleys have bisexual spikes with the, the male flowers at the base and female flowers at the top, kind of candrous. So here's a nice picture from Minnesota. Again, we don't have to worry about this one because we're not dealing with it, but Bicnelli, Molesta, and Breviar looking at their perigenia. Bicnelli, much larger, much larger here, much wider and longer. So these are really big. The other thing about uh, Bicnelli also is the, the akene, certainly when the perigenia are mature, the akene really shows up. You can see the akene through the wall of the perigenia here. The wall of the perigenia is really translucent, membranous, thin tissue. And so that you can see the akene right here without any problem at all. It's this area right here. So just the size of the perigenia, uh, you know, is, is going to uh, help you find Bicnellii. Uh, with Molesta and Breviar, these two are difficult. <laughs> Uh, I almost always collect uh, samples of these just to bring them back and, and check because there are some characteristics, some field characteristics that are supposed to work, that, that, that at least you know, would tend to work, um, but I find that they're not always 100% reliable. And so what I usually do is I, I just grab a spike or two, and you know, so I have some perigenia, that's all you need, bring it back and dig out the akeen. So again, here's the perigenia. You can see there is a difference. And this is one of the characteristics. Breviar tends to be more orbicular, circular, with a more quickly reduced, you know, more abrupt base to the beak, and molesta more ovoid, uh, with a tapering uh, edge here going into the beak. But again, yeah, that that can vary. What really seems to be more consistent which would make more sense too, because this is the fruit and fruits shouldn't vary as much, is the width of the akenes. Uh, Molesta is gonna be less than 1.3 mil millimeters wide and Breviar is gonna be greater than 1.3. You can also see somewhat by the shape, but it, it doesn't take long to pull a few akenes out and put a um, ruler on them and see what they are. All right, James Eye, this is a really distinctive one. Now we're getting into the uh, three uh, or trifid, you know, three styles, looking at bisexual um, and male. So James Yai is a distinctive one because it's just a little, uh, it's a short little uh, species. It's, it's really uh, cespitose or clumped. Um, it looks, like, looks grass-like. In fact, grass sedge is one of the common names for it. Uh, and it's got really distinctive perigenia. Uh, these um, obovate perigenia with a fairly distinct beak, really distinct beak here. And the beak is pretty significant. You know, it takes up about at least half or probably about at least a third of the length of the perigenia. And then um, really distinctive are the pistillate scales. This, this is a pistillate scale of this perigenia and they have very long tapering tips to them. Here's another pistolet scale here. These pistolet scales are so huge and so big, they, they look like they're inflorescence bracts. In fact, you, could, you would almost mistake them for an inflorescence bract, but they're not inflorescence bracts. They're, they're actually the, the, 
the scales that subtend the perigenia. And where's the pistillate scales? So this is a really distinctive one. Then uh, the others in this group, uh, again, look, looking at those with three styles now, bisexual and then female, the BCI and Frankii, three unisexual male. We have this group, big group here. We're gonna separate them now on the pubescence or non-pubescence of the perigenia and the secondary characteristic on the teeth. And then there's actually sort of three groups in here. So glabrous, glabrous to slightly pubescent, that's what pubulant means. They can have a little bit of pubescence or clearly pubescent. So that's the three groups here is you pretty much have to allow for this possibility for these two species here. And then the last one here is three unisexual and female again, and there's none of those. There's also none right in here. And there's also none right in here, at least not in this group of 24. All right, so we'll burn through these quick here. The VCI is a pretty distinctive one. This is the one that has, again, the, the terminal spikelet is uh, bisexual with female flowers or perigenia up at the top and male flowers below. Then the rest of the spikes, the lateral spikes are all pistillate. It's also fairly pubescent on the lower sheaths. Um, that's a pretty good characteristic, the bottom side of the leaves, lower leaf blades, so there's pubescence on the plant. Uh, there's the uh, lower spikes down here tend to be on short little stems, and so they will be somewhat pendant and hang down. And um, the scales have pretty long uh, on tips on them. And you can sometimes see, you can see those on tips sticking out there on those scales. So that's a pretty easy one. The perigenia do tend to get fairly brownish and sort of amber colored later in the, in the growing season. The other one here is Frank's sedge or C. frankii, and it's really distinctive too. It can actually have um, a couple different situations going on with a terminal one. It might be bisexual and um, have uh, Let me look at here. So we yeah, might have um, unisexual and be male at the top, or it might be uh, bisexual and gynecandrous, meaning female at, at the top. So it's a little bit variable there. The lateral ones are always going to be pistillate, and they're always these very dense, thick uh, cylinders, basically, of just packed full of perigenia. And the thing that's really helpful here, and unfortunately, this one does not. Uh, is not represented in the Minnesota website, so we don't have real good pictures of the scales, but these scales have really long ons. And that's what you see sticking out here. The, the pistolet um, spikes look really bristly because these perigenia are sticking kind of straight out. If you pull out these perigenia, they're somewhat uh, obovate. So again, broader or wider towards the top. But the, they're subtended by scales, and these scales all have these really long ons that stick way out past the perigenia. Again, you can see those really easily there and there. So again, a pretty distinctive sedge really when it comes down to it. Blanda and Grissia are both somewhat similar and you know, key out close to each other. There's nothing really else that you're gonna, at least not in this group, and I don't think there's anything else in Iowa that has this sort of situation where you've got this trigonous perigenia and a short little beak, but clearly the beak is bent over. There's not much of a beak there, but what there is is clearly like it's been pushed over, bent over. Uh, Bland is one of the easiest ones to identify because of that. Grissia uh, has, I, I always call this the football shaped perigenia, perfectly ellipsoid perigenia look like a perfect football. They have very little to no, no beak at all. If there is a little bit of a beak, then it's straight. Uh, but there's no teeth on any of these, of course, because there's basically not much of a beak there. This is the real common one. These are both somewhat common in floodplain forests, but Blanda will grow, it'll grow out in open sunny environments, disturb grassy areas as well. Hysteracina, the porcupine sedge, um, Pretty distinct again because of its um, long ons 
on the on this on most of the scales. The there's only one male or staminate spike. That's one thing that helps again separate it from others that look similar. It just has one staminate spike and then several pistol spikes down below, uh, fairly large perigenia, lots of venation. And again, it's called porcupine sedge basically because of these long beaks uh, and how they stick out. And again, give the, um, the overall pistol spike this, this bristly and spiky kind of look to it. In this case, again, the spiky looks coming from the long beaks on the perigenia. Here's lupulina. Kind of somewhat similar. This is in forest uh, floodplains for the most part, but it can grow in somewhat sunny environments as well. Uh, hop sedge, and it um, has these inflated perigenia, somewhat inflated. Uh, that's how it disperses the fruits. And um, again, sort of a very long cylindrical pistillate spike. Uh, fairly large um, perigenia. The perigenia are at least 10 millimeters or more long. Uh, the perigenium beak again is fairly long. What you'll need to use here is, is the, uh, the, there are teeth here, but the teeth are really short and that will help separate, separate it from some other species. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, just about there. Springetli eye is a really distinctive one. Real easy one with these drooping, long drooping uh, spikes and these very, very characteristic um, perigenia that have a body that's almost circular globe-like, um, a sphere, and then just drastically narrows down to this really long, narrow beak. I mean, there's, this, there's nothing else that you're gonna really confuse this with, at least um, based on the commonness of it. So Springelii. Springle sedge, very distinctive. Gray's sedge, the little um, mace uh, 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 sedge, looks a little bit like uh, lupulina in some ways, again, except that the rather than having a cylindrical pistillate spike, what it has are these globose or spherical pistillate spikes. Again, pretty distinctive in that regard. Leviconica. Levaconica and Trichocarpa are both somewhat similar, um, but distinctive in um, the glabrous perigenia here and the pubescent perigenia and Trichocarpa, which we'll see in just a little bit. This one has the really good, this is a good example of the fribulose uh, sheaths right here, where again, the sheath, some of the sheath tissue has disintegrated and has disappeared, leaving just some vein structure there. But this is this can be a good characteristic for it vegetatively. Um, there's a ligule, very big teeth, very large teeth. These teeth are over two millimeters uh, long, and so very very conspicuous there. But the gla the perigenia are going to be glabrous here. Whereas in these three, and this is the last slide, these three all have hairy perigenia. You see the pubescence on these perigenia. So again, we'll start with trichocarpa because this one looks like Levaconica, grows in the same kind of sedge meadow uh, environments. But a couple things, you have the hairy perigenia, of course, which is a dead giveaway. But on the, um, the, sh the ventral side of the sheaths, most of the time trichocarpa has this very distinctive uh, dark purplish brown coloration pattern that you see here. Otherwise, again, the gestalt, the size of the spikes is, is similar to Levaconica. But over here, woolly sedge is really distinctive. It was one of the two sedges on the, on the first slide there. Uh, the other one was Subarecta. But it, again, has the uh, pubescent uh, perigenia, uh, a small, fairly slight sedge, it, but it can grow in lots of different environments. Take a look at the table. It, it's somewhat of a dis disturbance species. Um, packed in, the perigenia are packed into the pistolet spike. You can kind of see the short little spikes here, but they're packed in there uh, almost like, you know, a little tight cluster of, 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 of grapes. That's another way of thinking about them, I think. And then Pennsylvanica, pen sedge. Uh, this, of course, is going to be an upland woodlands, so open forest, very important uh, species in those environments. 
It has very distinctive bases, reddish, reddish, reddish coloration to the, the base of the, um, the sheaths and the base of the stems. There's again, is pubescence, not pubescence, but it has this, again, ovovoid, wider at the top than at the base, uh, shape here, short little beak. Um, here it is uh, with the male uh, stamina uh, spike at the top, and then the lateral spikes down below are pistillate. All right, well, that's, that's all I better take. Uh, we've got through all 24 uh, real quick. So if there's a uh, little uh, time for a few questions, we'll entertain a few, I guess, and otherwise call it good. Go out, look, go sedge hunting uh, later this spring. Yeah, so we do have a couple of questions. I think one of them got answered. Um, someone was asking about the color coding on the maps. And then somebody sent a link to the bone app key. So a link yeah. to the the link to the bone app page. Yeah. Yeah, that that's a good website to have link just to pull up those distributions. Bone app does a pretty good job, of course, because it can show county level dis distributions. Uh, and it's, you know, it's probably the best we've got as far as the distributions at that scale at the entire uh, United States. Just realize that there are mistakes in Bone app, um, bound to be mistakes in something like that, but for the most part, it's pretty good and useful. Okay. And then Leland asks, um, as for other herbaceous tacks of the species names, for some sedges seem to switch back and forth, such as Carex amphibola. Um, I'm guessing this is from molecular biology studies, but it presents yeah, difficulties so, for field work. Yeah, so yeah, again, so what we have again here in the table is the flora of North America treatment, which does include uh, some of the most recent uh, molecular studies that have been done in these different tribes, different groups of, of carex. And, um, you know, and sometimes when we have the problem of scientific names changing, uh, it's because it could be because of that, because new phylogenetic uh, evidence research shows that the relationships that previously were thought to occur uh, aren't correct. And so there's a correction in the um, phylogenetic representation there. Remember that scientific names, the whole scientific uh, nomenclatural system is one that's based on phylogenetics, evolutionary linkages. And so when there's new evidence of how, what groups should be together, which groups are, you know, evolved in the same groups, then the names have, have to change to, to reflect that. Sometimes name changes happen because of mistakes that were made in the initial naming process. There's, a, there's rigid rules that have to be followed when scientific names are given to plants. And, and sometimes, you know, um, those get um, overlooked or they or mistakes get made. So sometimes corrections are made in that that causes a new name then to be applied to a species. With respect to Grisia and Amphibola, um, what we have in, we used to have Carex Amphibola variety turgida, uh, that's what you'll see on the, on the table there I, I put together for you. Um, that, that species still does exist, Carex amphibola does exist, but it doesn't exist in Iowa, it's to the east of us. Uh, what we have now is recognized as a different species, probably because of phylogenetic studies, uh, Carex grisia. So, I mean, that's one of the problems with, um, scientific names is that there's uh, the potential for names to change, of course, and because of new research that's done to clarify and further understand what the phylogenetic relationships are. We, we keep track of synonyms. I mean, that's, you can look in Florida, North America, and they'll give you a long list of, of the synonyms uh, that are applied to or go with the current correct name. Uh, that's the best way to try to deal with that, I think, is, is just use one of those websites. The USDA website also has a page that will list the synonyms uh, for, for species, too. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's what the question was. Yeah, we have a couple more questions, but I think since it's 8.13, 
Um, I'll just have you answer. I'll send these to you, and then we can send them out later. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. All right. Not